I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. This interview is actually a companion to my episode on absinthe. If you haven't already seen that episode, you may want to start there. There's a link in the card above. I've known Ted Bro for over 20 years, and we've met because we shared a common passion for researching and understanding absinthe. In fact, in that pursuit, I actually started a small firm importing absinthe-related antiques into the U.S. in the early 2000s. Those were pretty heady days, years before the absinthe ban was lifted in the United States and in the European Union, and I've always admired Ted's attention to both the science, but especially the art of absinthe distillation. He's a bit of an alchemist, and he produces what are recognized as some of the finest absinths in the world. Indeed, my favorite absinthe, a reproduction of the vintage absinthe C.F. Berger. In fact, it's one of the first pre-ban absinths I had the chance to sample back when we both traveled to Paris in 2001 in our quest to understand and reproduce historical absinthe. I have to say it was great to sit down with Ted to discuss the history, mythology, and science, or I might say alchemy, of absinthe. But also, make sure to check out my other interview with Marc Thulier, the world's leading expert on finding and sampling real historical bottles of absinthe produced before the ban in 1915. You can find that interview linked in the card above. And also, just make sure to check out my other content on magic, the occult, historical alchemy, and hermetic philosophy. These are topics that I think most people in absinthe tend to share for various reasons. But I hope you enjoy my chat with Ted Bro. All right, I'm very happy this evening to be joined by an old friend of mine, Ted Bro. He is an alchemist, a scientist, a distiller. He was instrumental in the legalization of authentic modern absinthe. And he is the founder and master distiller of Jade Liqueurs, one of the premier uh, brands of absinthe on the market today. Ted, I'm really glad to see you and have you on Esoterica. Welcome. Dr. Sledge, Justin, good to be here. So Ted, uh, can you tell us a bit about how you got into the world of, uh, how you got into the world of absinthe? It's a, it's a pretty niche, pretty niche world and uh, it's a pretty esoteric world. So how did you come into the world of studying absinthe and making it? Well, the beginnings for me um, are rooted uh, around the end of 1993. I was working as a scientist in an analytical laboratory and uh, absinthe was mentioned by a colleague of mine in a passing comment. And um, I had to ask him, "What? yeah, absinthe, what, what was that? He said, you know, it was that green liquor that made people crazy. And in the same week, I received a catalog in the mail entitled Alternative Books. And one of the books in this catalog happened to be Absent History in the Bottle by Barnaby Conrad, Chronicle Books 1988, which is uh, um, just a, a seminal um, guide in the modern era, you know, on Absent and very well done. And that, that had me hooked because uh, looking into this, I found that in my home city of New Orleans, that uh, absinthe indeed was a very popular spirit back in end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Yeah, so early beginnings, but back in those days, no internet, no Google, nothing. If you wanted to research something, you actually you had to get out into university libraries. So I spent quite a lot of time doing that. And it was frustrating because the more I looked, it seemed like the, the, the less good information I could find. There just wasn't much about this from credible sources. And, and what I could find was just mostly folkloric and anecdotal and, and, and much of it turned out to be uh, largely inaccurate and embellished. So for me, it was a fascinating subject. And of course, with all this mystery and myths that surrounded it, me being a scientist, uh, I was determined to understand what it was about this liquor this mysterious clean liquor that was deserving of its reputation. Right. And yeah, so, you know, that was, um, 
that was uh, that was a that was a tough time to study absent back in the early in the mid nineties. Yeah, difficult. And, and you also came across a couple of bottles of vintage absinthe, absinthe that was made before the ban and uh, in 1915. Um, and what, what, what were those? Which, do you still have those, by the way? Um, no, actually, well, a little background. So I, to study absinthe, one needs absinthe. And of course, there, there was none. And so uh, me having access to research equipment, um, from what references I could find, I attempted some distillations of absinthe. And then in 1996, within a 30 day period, uh, a very strange thing happened. And that is I just, I had not one, but two bottles of vintage absinthe fall into my lap from two completely different sources. Uh, one was basically dropped off uh, at an antique dealer uh, that I knew. And the other was, turned out to be a, an heirloom in a colleague, a work colleague's uh, family. And so the one that the one that um, the one that uh, was dropped off the antique shop was a very early, uh, circa early 1920s uh, Pernod Tarragona, mm -hmm. and then the the one from the colleague was a, a rough late 1890s uh, Edward Pernod export 72 percent export version that was bought by his great grandfather while visiting Cuba. Wow. Way back. Well, which is where Hemingway was getting his absinthe uh, at, the, exactly. at the time. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly. Great. And so those two bottles, which were full unopened bottles, would provide the equivalent of the Rosetta Stone because what was in those bottles was truly representative of what absinthe was, both from a both from a tasting standpoint, as well as from a standpoint of composition, an analytical standpoint. Right. All right. And that's and that's what's really fascinating about your story, Ted, uh, is that. Uh, sorry, I'll start that over. Um, and that's what's really fascinating about your story, Ted, is that uh, you just have to you you're you're the you're the guy who has the great mind, access to the equipment access to the absent, and then of course, access to the right questions, right? And I think that that's what's really, it all comes together in your story in a really fascinating way. Um, so take us through the science side of this whole business. Uh, you have a background in chemistry um, and it's amazing, right? To get a guy who has a background in chemistry, interested in absinthe, and then gets a couple bottles of pre-ban uh, absinthe uh, dropped in their lap. Uh, tell us, walk us through the the scientific analysis of, of those bottles and, uh, and what you learned? Well, I think th I, this situation, I, I'm an outlier, being that I was sort of the right person in the right place at the right time when all this transpired. And um, you know, when, when these two bottles of vintage absinthe fell into my lap, I, I wasn't actively seeking them. Um, it's, it's strange. It's, I know it's strange as it sounds, it's almost like they found me. It's really funny how this happened. It's just almost too, too coincidental. But um, at the time, I was working as a scientist and basically I was doing quite a lot of uh, analysis of contaminated soils and water, looking for um, specific organic you know, industrial contaminants. So that explains why I had access to certain types of equipment, mm -hmm. as, as did my peers. So. For me, it was a, you know, I, I just got around to thinking that, you know, I've got the equipment to analyze these two bottles as well as samples of absinthe that I've distilled for a re, on a research basis um, that I should, I should analyze these. And there's no better, there's no more truthful, accurate way to gain insight composition of absent than to analyze it. Um, and here I had two celebrated brands, uh, no, no doubt appreciated by, uh, by people a century before. So uh, for me, I just found myself at, you know, at the right time where I was able to, um, to recalibrate equipment. And um, what I did, this was back in uh, June of 2000, 
where I, it, I was able to analyze these samples of AdSense. And I was determined to get to the bottom of what in absent was the problem, what inside of it was hallucinogenic or poisonous, somehow deleterious or psychoactive, what was in it. And um, what I found was so astounding that it initially I felt almost, I was, I almost felt like I'd been put back to square one. I had to rethink everything, this whole, this whole mental construct that I had put together over year, over the years and, and, and reading these articles uh, about it, like in Scientific American, you know, I had a thought, I had a very firm idea of what I would find when I analyzed these bottles, all this absent. And what I found was basically nothing. In other words, there was nothing in these bottles that was poisonous, hallucinogenic, deleterious to health. In fact, those bottles and other samples of vintage absinthe that I would acquire right around that time, all the same. There was really no reason why those bottles couldn't be sold today. And I, I just to be sure of my results, I had everything I did verified by a third party laboratory and they came back with the same answer. So for me, it was like, well, well, how can this be? Um, everything that I, you know, that I, I planned for, everything that I expected was just shattered. So I had to go back and follow the truth and then basically recalibrate my thinking. So and how, yeah. many, how many, how many different uh, vintage absence have you, uh, have you analyzed? And you're analyzing these in like something like a mass spectrometer, I guess. Yes, mass spectrometer. Yep. Yes, gas chromatograph, mass spectrometer. Um, well, basically, it, by this point in time, uh, I've uh, co-authored a couple of uh, pub scientific articles published in peer-reviewed journals on the composition of vintage absinthe uh, with some other researchers, and uh, we've tested, we've analyzed dozens right. by this point in time. All drawn, all drawn from bottles that we verify could could positively verify were sealed, had never been opened, samples drawn with witnesses present, you know, chains of custody, doing all this the right way so that the integrity of the data is, is incontestable. And so, and so from a scientific point of view, conclusive evidence that the, uh, that the legends about absinthe causing insanity or all these sort of things, aside from, you know, it being 72% alcohol or what have you, which is not exactly a light punch, but nothing from the herbal side of things and this infamous Thujone business that would uh, that would indicate that absinthe was uh, was deleterious. It's a really an, uh, a stellar find. What's interesting to me is that also the mathematical side of it never made sense to me. I come to the same conclusion when you look at the amount of absinthe being consumed in, in the year 1900. If it were causing people to go insane, then basically France would have lost its mind. Um, <laughs> You know, for the 20 years or so that absinthe was all the rage after the phylloxera plight, um, but and I remember looking at that and I'm like, there's no way that people are drinking absinthe and going completely stark raving mad. Um, so the math never added up to me, and and and, and of course uh, you have a much better argument. Uh, the mass spectrometer doesn't lie, and it's really an incredible pioneering work you did there. Well, having the experimental results and then going back and and putting this inserting this into history in a way that provides that, that, that provides accurate context uh, was challenging. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's almost like doing things in reverse here. And, 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 and it was a bit of a conundrum. There, there, there were some, some, some aspects of it that initially were difficult to reconcile. I wouldn't exactly put it in the same league as trying to understand Heisenberg's uncertainty principle or solve the, uh, the conundrum of um, wave particle duality. But um, it, uh, it, is, it, it was a bit confusing, but the reason what makes absent confusing is not the science. The science is pure, the science makes perfect sense. What makes, where absent becomes confusing is when humans and human nature is inserted into the equation. Because when we research absinthe, the reason why absinthe has such a, a sordid history, I mean, no other spirit on the shelf of a bar has the history that absinthe does. 
And the reason why is because the history of absinthe is not clouded by science. It's clouded by politics, economics, greed, um, the, 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 the science being unable to resolve a decades long debate because it wasn't advanced enough to do it. You know, one, one analogy that I use when I summarize the debacle of absentism, or so it was called, right. is going back about a century and a half earlier to a, a phenomenon that, uh, that happened in London, a bit of a tragedy that became known as the gin craze. Mm -hmm. And we see like Hogarth's artwork that depicts Gin Lane and Beer Alley, and gin was known as Mother's Ruin. And is that because gin is poisonous? No. But we know that if we make gin from industrial alcohol and add some turpentine to it, uh, and some, some, some very un, unhealthy adulterants, we know that it becomes uh, deleterious. And who is most affected by this? The same group. In, in all pictures, it's the, the lower rungs of socioeconomic status. It's the poor alcoholics that bear the brunt of this. And when we go back, we think back to a day, to an era when there was no, it was everything you bought was caveat emptor. You know, facial creams had like lead or mercury. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, basically, what we know is that when distilled properly in a strict accordance to tradition, absinthe is no more harmful than any other spirit. The most harmful thing about absinthe is the alcohol. Yeah, you, you're, you hear these, you know, the, the stories about things like copper sulfate being used as a colorant in some very cheap uh, absinthe. And it's, it's fascinating to, that you guys, uh, that none of those bottles have ever been recovered. Uh, for, to my knowledge, uh, and you would know obviously better than I that, that we've never recovered a bottle of absinthe that contained those kinds of uh, adulterants. Uh, but perhaps they, perhaps in very cheap absinthe, they did, they, they did exist. Well, that's because today, you know, I'm often asked, where does one come across a bottle, a full bottle of vintage absinthe? I mean, it seems like uh, the proverbial may as well be the proverbial hen's tea. Right. But you know. The, the thing is, when you go back to these old estates in Europe that have been in the same family for generations, which is not unusual, and they all have their own wine cellars, and many of them are just, they're just piles of dusty bottles, and eventually someone gets hired, some expert gets hired to go down there and identify everything and uh, assay the, you know, assess the value, rather, of everything there. I mean, every now and then, a you know, bottles of it, it's not just wine that's down there. They're vintage spirits. I mean, I've seen Jamaican rum from the 1880s that I've been able to taste, gin from the 19th century, you know, old Tom gin, uh, rye whiskey, uh, lots of different pre phylloxera cognacs, um, uh, um, antique chartreuse, uh, different vermouths, you know. But the thing is, when a bottle of absinthe does pop up, it's almost invariably a good one of the top brands because people that had wine cellars just didn't buy the adulterer. We would love to find a bottle of the adulterated absence that the journalist from the era wrote about that left a distinct metallic taste in one's mouth from being artificially colored, like you mentioned with copper sulfate, to have been adulterated with antimony trichloride in an attempt to increase the, the luching effect. That's the cloudiness when ice water is added, a feature that consumers demanded. We also find you know, there's certain things that have only come to light in recent years. For example, in having a discussion with an ethnobotanist from the University of Kent, one startling, <laughs> startling piece of information that I had never considered is, you know, back in the old French literature, you, you know that, that traditional absinthe was always distilled from the core, from a basis of three important botanicals, those being grand absinthe, of course, sweet fennel and green anise. Right. And you know, the old literature, star anise, which is basically almost everything you find today, which tastes like anise, or what we North Americans erroneously refer to as licorice, which doesn't, it's a misnomer. 
but anything that tastes like anise today, candies, liqueurs like Sambuca, whatever, there's all flavored pastis, all flavored by adding oil of Chinese or Vietnamese star anise to alcohol. And the thing is, there, is, there are many different, there are quite a few different species of star anise, even a couple that are native to North America. The problem they all have is they are all poisonous except for one. And there are numerous, numerous instances of Chinese star anise being adulterated with like Japanese star anise, which is poisonous, even though the two are visually almost indistinguishable. Mm. They taste the same. One contains anisatin and shikimic acid, which are both harmful to the nervous system. Again, sounds familiar. You know, when we look at all the, all the likely adulterants one would have used, uh, some profiteer in the warehouses of Paris or Lyon might have used to create an inferior acid that poisoned poor alcoholics. You know, we find, we find that, that these adulterants, all the exposure of these adulterants just miraculously seem to contribute symptoms that are often described as being typical of absenteeism. Right. It's basically, it's they're suffering from things like heavy metal poisoning and stuff like that. Exactly. So, and I'm, to my knowledge, star anise wasn't even introduced into Europe until later in the history of absinthe that it was. Yeah, star anise, a product of Vietnam and China, was always uh, uh, viewed uh, suspiciously right. as being inferior. And their their old uh, mentions, their, their, it's mentioned in, in old references as being poisonous um, when distilled which doesn't really make sense, unless of course it's adulterated. And we find that instances of even, even as late as like the 1950s, where there are documented instances of people being poisoned by adulteration of star anise wow. in Europe. Wow. And that's so, the heyday of pastis, is 1950s, 1960s. So. Yeah, so that's, you know, it, it's, it's amazing. It's like with absinthe, it's like one never seems to get to the bottom of the rabbit hole. Right. There's always something new that pops up that just another piece in the puzzle of what is a, a, a very complex story. No, and I think that's why it's sort of a perennially interesting uh, drink, even though now it uh, authentic, real absinthe has been legalized in the European Union and in the United States and Canada, I think. Um, and so you're a big part of spearheading that effort. Uh, Ted, could you tell us a little bit about uh, I know that was a really complicated, long process, and we were friends well, friends at the time whereas you were all going through it. Uh, but could you tell tell folks about how that process uh, happened and how folks can now know that they are getting, uh, when they buy authentic absinthe, they are getting absinthe made just the way that it was in the, uh, in the 19th century by the great houses like Pernod Fils? Well, uh, in 1988, the European Union countries adopted new food and beverage laws to facilitate import and export between them. And in doing so, those laws superseded all the previous laws. So basically, absent all these countries, Belgium, Germany, uh, you know, the, the Netherlands, France, um, all these countries where absent had been banned, that ban was lifted, quietly lifted. No one realized it for the longest time. So basically, people began testing the waters in Europe. But none of these products, as you'll remember, were really quality products. They were all just made from fla you know, flavored vodka with, with green dye is basically what they were. And having tasted vintage absinthe, you've taken a bite of the, the poison apple because now you know, you know, back in the, you know, you might remember that, you know, some 20 years ago, we were both members of a very uh, lonely club of people that knew what vintage absinthe tasted like and were alive to, to talk about. It. Right, they must have. There probably were only ten of us in the world at that time that knew. It, right, there there weren't many. There weren't many, and um, so basically, for me, once I had amassed this body of, of knowledge, both from um, research, um, both published and non-published written materials, as well as all the analyses that I had from the vintage bottles, I had enough information to more or less recreate these original brands. And of course I couldn't do that in the US because absinthe was still illegal as it had been since 1912, still banned basically. Um, so I started, I, I went to France and um, you know, I, I, I had a choice. Either I was going to di discuss everything, either disclose everything I knew in a book or do something else, which I 
determined would be much more interesting, and that is go to Europe and find a way to make the original products using the original materials and hopefully using the, in, in using original equipment. So that was a tall order. Eventually, I would come to do that. Um, so I started distilling absinthe in France in January of 2004, and it was still very much, as you will call, a, a bit of a gray market product. There was still some legal ambiguity over absinthe. And um, basically, I, because of some of the publicity that I generated from this, from this effort, I, was a, I, I, I met a couple of, uh, several entrepreneurs from New York who were prepared to put some money on the table. And, it, and basically, we came to an agreement that if I could, if, if, if they would fund the effort to overturn the ban in the US, the 95 year ban by uh, 2007, that they would foot the bill. And my responsibility in exchange for that would be to create a brand for them, which would become Lucid Absent Superior, um, sold in the US. And uh, basically, so on March 5th, 2007, Lucid became the first genuine absent to be uh, um, sold in the United States. And what people don't understand is that the U.S. government, to, to sell a spirit in the U.S. government, you, it's, you're guilty until proven innocent. And the, to be perfectly honest, it wasn't the content of absinthe that was the problem. Surprisingly, that was the easy hook. Right. The hoop of fire was actually being able to call it absinthe. Yeah, it was the labeling, I think. that was The, the label, big... that's it. They yeah. were very yeah. concerned about uh, allowing us to put absinthe on the label, and that was a huge holdup. And they wanted us just to turn around and go home, but we just, you know, we we, we were determined. And they and in the, in the course of all these negotiations and discussions, they got to know us and realized that, you know, they had seen the debacle of, of Europe, where in, in countries like the Czech Republic, for example, you had all these green, you know, these flavored vodkas with green dye posing as absinthe and, and showing people lighting it on fire and, and promising hallucinations, which of course never come. And it was killing the category as fast as it was generating interest in it. And the U.S. government had seen that and was aware of all this was going, didn't want any part of that. And I can't blame them. And then, you know, and so when we convinced them, for us, that we were determined to bring absent back to the position of respectability that originally held in, in you know, co proper cocktail bars at the turn of the century, they eventually warmed up to it. But that wasn't the end of, and, and let me tell you, that was quite an expensive uh, um, legal exercise. The, but that wasn't the end for me because also in 2007, something else happened. And that is in 2007, because in, in France, in, in 1988, someone in the French Ministry of Health realized that absinthe was suddenly legal again. So they quietly passed a decree that any absinthe that contained enough grand absinthe, enough fennel, and enough hyssop, you know, another traditional, uh, tr traditional European herb that's used in the distillation of absinthe, any absinthe like spirit that contained enough of these three would be, would legally be declared an absinthe and the draconian penalties of the original French band of 1915 would magically reappear. Mm. And I became, because my products are the only ones in France that met that criteria, I became the last producer in France to be charged and fined under the original absent ban of 1915. Another expensive legal exercise. Um, and in this case, basically went to the French Ministry of Health and, and asked for a scientific rationale as to why this decree should exist. And after some time, they finally came back and said, we can't find any. <laughs> and so they struck it. And that was the last vestige of the original absent ban in Europe to be wow. swept aside on. That was 2009. Wow. Quite did, a did you get a refund on the, the fine? No, I had to spend thousands of euros to avoid being put in jail for the heinous crime that I committed of distilling an absent that was just too real uh, for the French authorities. Wow. So, um, yeah, no, I didn't get my money back. Uh, but uh, anyway, it opened the door for better quality, you know, good, good distillers and better quality absence in Europe. So uh, I spent a lot of money opening doors. Yeah. 
But yeah, that, that a lot of folks I think are are able to walk through now and, and they don't realize just how much uh, of a headache uh, and financial loss you had to go through to pioneer uh, the recreation of, of, of authentic absinthe. And again, I think that's one of these things where people don't know this and uh, maybe they, after watching this, they'll, they'll have a better idea of it. And we can all thank Ted and raise the glass to Ted for, uh, for pioneering uh, this work. Uh, Ted, you, you've also, you're an absinthe maker, you're a distiller, you're, you, you have several marks uh, that you prepare. Uh, could you tell us something about what you've learned in the process of making as absinthe at the commercial, at the commercial level? It's one thing to, to, to make laboratory samples in a, a vacuum distillery, a vacuum still. I imagine it's quite a different thing. Uh, and we'll talk about the actual distillery there at Combier in just a minute, but, you know, scaling up to, I think, what are those 1200 liter stills that you work on um have you have you what have you learned about the the process of absinthe making that that may have been forgotten in the past hundred years well no matter how much you know or you think you know um scaling up from a two liter vacuum distillation apparatus into a 275 uh, or 1100 liter actual bannery that is a steam jacketed pot still, an absinthe still from the 1880s is definitely a big leap. It is a giant leap. And the funny thing about science is that theoretically it should be fairly straightforward to scale things up. Well, theoretically that's true, but in reality it doesn't always work that way. It took me a while to um, to learn my way around antique equipment with no automation, um, which is a beautiful thing, by the way. I mean, it's if there's anything that injects art and creativity into absent crafting, it is the lack of automation and the limitations that uh, spawn creativity. And for me, it really gave me an opportunity, <laughs> a necessity, I should say, of having to, of coming across certain obstacles that one will not experience unless distilling absinthe on an ongoing basis on that scale. Mm. And then it's, you come across something that you, you couldn't have, you, you didn't plan for, and then you think, wait a minute, what do I do? And then the correct answer is almost always a matter of, of Occam's razor in that, or I should say, the correct answer is the one that, that makes the most financial sense as opposed to the one that may seem the most romantic. Mm. So the old distillers, you know, they, it was a beautiful thing that they did. There was a fair amount of practicality into it as well. So, you know, they ran businesses. So, uh, yeah, it's a fascinating world. Yeah, to tell us about those, uh, about working at Combier, one of the things that maybe folks know don't know about, uh, about Combier is that is a historic uh, distillery. It's been there for a century, more than a century. Uh, and the stills there are actually the former stills from Pernod Fils. I think that, is that right? Well, to, to get to that point, back in 2002, I started looking around France um, with the help of uh, our mutual friend, Peter Schaff. Do you remember? remember. Uh, he and I started uh, looking around France for a suitable distillery that maybe had some antique equipment that would be willing to work out a deal with me to where I could use their equipment. And of course, the natural thing for us was to go to Pastis Distilleries. But what we discovered was that Pastis is not distilled today. So- um, Oil mixes? What's that? It's just oil mixes these days? It's just, it's straight up taking alcohol and adding oil and star anise and sugar and some, some uh, a li a licorice root extract and some yellow dye. Um, there is no distillate. Yeah, it's pastis is unfortunately today strictly a, 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 an industrial product with you know very little art. That's what we found. But just by chance, Peter happened to find uh, the uh, the Combier Distillery, and, and I had just just returned to New Orleans from France, and I had to go right back like two weeks later. And the Combier Distillery is it's an anachronism. It's fantastic. It's it, the, the distillery was originally founded in 1834, but in the 1880s, they underwent a, uh, a, a large expansion and the architect was none other than Gustav Eiffel. And all the original equipment that he 
uh, implemented from the 1880s is all there. It's all present. It's all working. The distillery uses the equipment to distill absent before the ban. And uh, since I've been back, since uh, the, the beginning of 2004, um, the, the, this, this equipment that hadn't distilled absent in almost a century now does again. Wow. So yeah, it's fantastic stuff. You just cannot get any more authentic. It is just not a more authentic place, you know, to, to distill it. It's uh, fantastic stuff. But like I said, no automation. So it would definitely take some learning. Yeah, well, you're a strong guy. Uh, you got you got the guns for it, carrying around the 50 pound bags of uh, <laughs> lithium. So uh, it's work. It's a constant. It's a constant dance. It's a constant chess game uh, that's uh, with um, a, a great deal of physical labor uh, in between movements. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Yeah. So Ted, aside from uh, uh, wormwood, grand wormwood, Artemisia absinthium, and anise and fennel. What other kind of herbs go into into absinthe, either on the distillation side or on the the coloration side? I think a lot of folks don't realize that absinthe is uh, colored basically with a an infusion, like a tea bag, uh, with different kinds of, of herbs. So, what kind of herbs uh, have you found go well into the uh, into the absinthe that you make? Well, um, I I think a, I think a great way to to preface the answer to this question is to take a step back into antiquity. Um, you know, back in the day, of course, wine has been made for a very, very long time. Of course, uh, in the days before sodium metabisulfite, you had a you had a very limited time frame in which to drink wine before it became before van became van igra, sour wine vinegar. So, the one good thing uh, that you can do with wine that is going to go bad is one can distill it, distill it into brandy. And brandy doesn't go bad. And what one can do with that brandy is take some Mediterranean spices like green anise, soak that into the brandy, redistill it. And what comes out the other end is arak, oraki, or ouzo. So the process of distilling brandy that's been scented with Mediterranean botanicals like anise and fennel goes back a you know, very long time. It just so happens that um, I, in reading a copy of Nicholas Culpepper's The Complete Herbal from 1653, which was the first real herbal medicine book that was published in English so that commoners could understand it, which of course uh, the medical community uh, didn't like. But Culpepper makes a, a very pertinent comment and when talking about Artemisia absinthe and grand absinthe, and that he says it is sometimes distilled with anise seeds. Mm -hmm. So we think of, you know, lore tells us that the beginning of absinthe is back at some time in the latter half of the 18th century. But in reality, in reality, taking a, a bitter herb like grand absinthe and distilling it with with herbs that have that, are, that have a present that sweeten the breath, like green anise and sweet fennel, this goes back a long time. So that is the basis of absinthe. It, you know, the, we, you know, when when you read folklore, and you know, you think that absinthe was created by you know, some some people in Switzerland, and this was sort of a new concept, but it really wasn't. This was a twist on some on a very uh, well established concept in medicine. Right. Um, where basically you're taking a very medicinal herb, Artemisia absinthium, and you're distilling with two other plants, which are carminative aids, these are flavor enhancers, anise and fennel, and because they have very strong flavors, all these three have very strong flavors, you can make a maceration of those in, in wine alcohol and brandy, and you distill them, and you get this very perfumed distillate. Now to that, if we take other traditional European medicinal herbs like lemon balm, hyssop. Lemon balm is Melissa officinalis. Hyssop is hyssopus officinalis. You know, others like mint, uh, veronica. Uh, we find numerous uh, Roman wormwood, Artemisia pontica, which was long used in aromatized wines like vermouth. If we take those, so once this perfume distillate is made, if we take these other plants that are not as strong, in flavor, 
They're, they're relatively mild, they're fine. And we macerate those in our distillate and we get more flavor and we also get this beautiful green color. And that is the basis for absinthe. So while the core of that, you know, if you look at any traditional gin recipe, as far back as you go, you find juniper and coriander. You'll find a wealth of others, but juniper and coriander are two constants. Just as in the recipe for any traditional absinthe is a distillation of at least grand absinthe, green anise, pimpinella anise, and sweet fennel, paniculum vulgari. Those three are the basis. Everything else is really up to the distiller. And it makes perfect sense that in the birthplace of absinthe, which is along the Franco-Swiss border, the foothills, you know, the Jura, the foothills of the Alps, the Franche-Comte, we find that they traditionally used botanicals that were available to them. So that is the traditional basis of that. Yeah, and do you, and do you think that, um, I mean, I think all, all alcohols have a, a kind of unique intoxication, whether they be tequila or brandy or beer or wine. Uh, do you think that, that, the, that the intoxication of absinthe, given the, the sort of herbal cocktail to be found in various kinds of absinthe, that do you think that does contribute to, I don't know, many people report, and I think I've experienced as well, a kind of uh, uh, clarity or vividness uh, after having had some absinthe. And again, it's, this is all, you know, somewhat anecdotal and difficult to scientifically uh, pin down. But um, what, what, what say you, Ted Bro, the scientist, alchemist, distiller? Uh, do you think that the, the herbal cocktail does give it, uh, and again, I don't want to go back to the insane propaganda of absentism and Van Gogh with his, his ear problems or, you know, Rimbo charging around urinating on people or whatever. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I, what, what did it say you about the, 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 the intoxication of, of absinthe? Well, I think if we put it into context, if we go back and let's say that one were to live for a day like one of the Bohemian artists or poets in, in Belle Epoque, Paris, whereby that person eats very little, smokes a pipe all day long, and then toward the, you know, late in the afternoon, knocks back two or three absents in quick succession. It's quite special. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, it, it, there, there are certain aspects of, of absent that, are difficult to, to quantify uh, or even qualify scientifically. Um, very much of that is subjective, but you know, I, to, to have a couple of glasses of absinthe, um, you know, while smoking a great deal and, and on a fairly empty stomach is, uh, uh, I guess some people could refer to it as, as, as makes you feel creative. I guess that's one way to express the, um, the impression. Of course, it's very subjective, so to each his own. But, uh, you know, it's, I think it's uh, fun that we can say that absinthe is uh, sort of special in that regard. And of course, being that it's, you know, typically good absinthe, we're typically bottled between 60 and 72 percent alcohol. That certainly which, doesn't hurt. Yeah, between 130 or 120 and 144 proof. Yeah, it does pack a punch. And the thing is, you know, it is very concentrated herbal spirit. So, uh, yeah, who knows? It's just yeah. one of those questions that who knows if science will ever be able to answer that. Right. And I guess everyone out there, uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the bohemian diet or lack thereof. Just uh, don't eat, smoke a pipe, and throw back to absence in quick succession. And uh, maybe you'll be a, a bad Rimbo or a bad Van Gogh. Well, you know, back in, back in the day, because uh, there was a movement to... Um, it was a, a big smear campaign uh, mobilized against absinthe by the winemakers and the brandy makers. You know, I mean, if you want to smear absinthe and you pick out the one ingredient that you find in absinthe, that you find in very little of anything else, which is Artemisia absinthe, brand absinthe, and you say it's a poison. And of course, when asked why, you pick out something that occurs in it and you accuse it of being poisonous. And it, it, that was something called Fuja, as you know. And it was alleged that this was a hallucinogenic substance, which it's not. It's, uh, it's actually an epileptic convulsant. And anyone that would ever get to that point with Fuja would never 
will allow themselves to do it a second time. But the fact of the matter is what these antique models prove is that's a non-argument. That's a non-issue. That was simply a scapegoat that was concocted to make absent look bad in a day when science could neither uh, prove nor refute, you know, couldn't settle the argument. And what we found is that that's absolutely bogus. Right. This is the time period where they would take a, a guinea pig and inject them with pure absinthe. And of course, the guinea pig would have a fit and die. And like, you know, if you think about injecting any creature with that body weight and with 70, 72% alcohol, it's basically just suffering from alcohol poisoning. Uh, and I think even the vintage apps in, the, in the, the studies show, right, that there's just basically no, no real detectable levels of Thujone at all. And you had to drink three bottles of absinthe to get something from the, you'd be long dead from the alcohol poisoning. Exactly. You'd be long dead from the alcohol poisoning. Thujone was never an issue. But, you know, back in the day, uh, Upton Sinclair, you know, uh, when everything was caveat mTOR and there were very little, there was very little in the way of any food and, or and beverage quality controls, you know, the, about the closest thing you had was an appellation of control um, or, you know, a, a geographic protection, which protected the way something was made, but there was no such protection for absinthe. And, you know, the French, for example, in literature, are very brand conscious when buying absinthe. Um, you know, back then, uh, you know, anyone who could afford to be brand conscious was because the people knew this was not, there was no secret. The people knew that there were some really rotten, cheap absence out there and would, wouldn't dare drink these. Right. So, you know, but if you want to smear absinthe, you don't make that distinction. You just say it's all poisons. Right. Which, and I'm sure that every distilled spirit at that time, there were all kinds of terrible versions of them. I'm sure there were, you know, terrible versions of brandy and terrible versions of whatever. And so uh, obviously that would be true of, of absinthe as well. It's just, of course, those absents aren't representative of, especially the great marks, Perno Feast, Perno Edward, uh, you know, the completely, again, and again, people forget these are consumed by the millions of liters uh, around the turn of the 20th century. And so no one- Yeah, I mean, back in, back in the day, you right. know, champagne, protected. Right. Cognac, protected. Armagnac, protected. You know, these are all appellate. I mean, these are, you know, these, these were all protected from the type of thing that happened to absinthe. Right. Going back to what I said previously, there's no better analogy in history than the gin craze, right. which was a terrible, the, the only thing that lifted the gin craze was a change in taxation right. in, in Britain. You know, it's, a, it's just the same thing. It's just this, this you know, the, the absinthe producers wanted a legal definition of absinthe, right. but the opponents of absinthe didn't want that. Because that would have solved, that would have removed the the, the basis of their complaint. Right, that would have uh, taken away the straw man. So uh, exactly. So. And once again, that was you know that was a lot, a lot of a lot of that was a time of you know when you look into it once again going back to what I said you know it's all the faults of human nature it's greed and politics um, and, and economics you know it's right. all factor all cloud all loose the history of absent. Right. Yeah. An, an unholy alliance of vintners and the temperance movement. Um, exactly. The temperance uh, movement. Who was, and the temperance movement was an unlikely bedfellow of the wine. No, right. Yeah. Because the wine know, had a shared interest in destroying absinthe. Uh, it was part of the, you know, after phylloxera, they, they, they were on their knees. So, at, the begin, at the beginning of the First World War, uh, you know, France banned all high proof spirits. Right because they didn't want soldiers drunken in the trenches. But yet every soldier got a daily ration of wine. Right. See, because wine's not really alcohol, right? Right, right, right. It's wine, right. So, you know, lots of this going on. And, and uh, yeah, it was a real mess. And of yeah. course, the whole phylloxera incident. Right, yeah. In it's... the 70s, 1880s, phylloxera ravaged the vineyards of Europe making, you know, I mean, because in France, you know, every meal Wine is accompaniment for every meal, morning, noon, and night. Right. And, um, and that changed that, you know, so. No, right. And I think that a lot of, uh, a lot of French vintners don't want to really admit that a lot of those, uh, a lot of those great grapes are now grown on American grape stock, which is because um, it's phylloxera resistant. So that's, uh, it's, it's always, that's all, that whole history is also just fascinating itself. The sister city of Cognac, France in the United States is Denison, Texas, the town that saved Cognac with its phylloxera-resistant rootstock. Yep. 
which, uh, you know, in France, so much of the wine in France today comes from U.S. rootstock. Of course, in all fairness, phylloxera came from the U.S. True. So, you know, but still, yes. Uh, an American solution to American problem. We're good at that. Uh, the way to be diplomatic when visiting France is to remind the French that most of their wine comes from American rootstock, uh, a historical fact that they no doubt appreciate. Yeah, I think so. Ted, what's your, what's your favorite absinthe that you've ever had? Uh, I know that you, know, you may be partial to, to your own, but in, including uh, pre-band vintage stuff, uh, some clandestinely made absinthe that we've had over the years. Uh, what's, what's, your, what's your favorite? What's, your, what's the, favorite, the favorite mark of yours? Well, you know, to be perfectly honest, it, it really depends on what I intend to do with them. Certain absinths, I think, are very, very well suited to the, the continental, you know, the French ritual, just a, you know, me, just a bit of ice water added to it. And then there are others that I think are better uh, suited to, to cocktails. Mm -hmm. You know, absinthe, because when you research absinthe, obviously you do so much from the continental European side that we forget that by 1900, fancy cocktails were very, very much fashionable in Anglo-American culture. And absinthe, when you look at Elvie's antique cocktail books, you know, which is, a, you know, the, the classic cocktail is a global, it's a global revolution, global renaissance, I should say. And absinthe is an indelible part of it. In fact, the Savoy cocktail book published in London in 1930 by American bartender Harry Craddock, who was bartending at this very posh hotel during Prohibition, there are like, uh, there are like 100 cocktails in the book that call for absinthe. So the absinthe that I would choose for certain cocktails may be different than the one I choose for the French ritual. So, you know, it's kind of like asking someone what's their favorite film. Difficult to pick out a favorite, but I know that there's some that I prefer to watch in, when I'm in certain moods as opposed to others. It's a similar thing. But one, one thing that's important is that, you know, back in the day, any fine absinthe you could have um, was pretty much going to be French or Swiss and, and quite traditional. And since the, the ban, you know, we've seen the clandestine Swiss style, the clear absinthe called as Le Bleu, lowered alcohol, a little bit more of a straightforward flavor profile. Um, you know, and then, and then here in just the past decade, we've seen some more, um, we've seen some, uh, some more um, uh, unusual, like, absinthe from here in the United States that have appeared that are a little less traditional, um, a little different. And the good thing about it is it's broadened the category a bit. So, you know, what I set out in, in, in with the jade absence that I distilled was recreating the very cornerstone, the foundation of the category, recreating that history. If you want to know what absinthe was back in the day, this is what it was. Now, let anything else that happens outside of that, you know, that's, that's fine. But this is the cornerstone. This is the root. The Rosetta Stone, this is the foundation of what made absinthe so popular back in the day. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's interesting to see how the, how the market has evolved a little bit. Fortunately, um, we've put a great deal of work into rebooting the European market. So now it's almost like, you know, the American the quality of, the, of absinthe to the American market is, is quite good. And then Europe has, has cleaned up its act over the past decade. And so we've seen a lot of that going on, which is good for the, the spirit as a whole uh, globally. That people will have to be able to, to have access to good absinthe or it'll just, they won't have a good experience and they'll never return to it. Yeah, I, I will say that my, my favorite uh, absinthe that I, I, is one of yours actually, is the, I think it used to be called the, the Vert Swiss, uh, the, re, the reproduction of the uh, absinthe burger, which I, uh, that the the famous baby powder uh, taste of that absinthe it's still it's still one of my favorites. So I uh, every year I, I treat myself to a bottle of that, Ted. So uh. <laughs> it's um yeah you know the funny thing about that one is that is you know each each of each of my absinthe has its own challenges, and that one is really you know that that particular which is um, in Europe it's sold as VS eighteen ninety eight. And here in the U.S., it's actually sold as CF Burger, right. um, the, the original name, which, of course, uh, went uh, folded in 1910 when, when Switzerland banned absinthe. Right. 
That was the most popular absinthe in Switzerland and back in the day. That I have quite a bit of information on that on that absinthe, both um, both from a, a, a non-published uh, written stand, notes, dist distillation notes, um, and also from scientific analysis. And yet, you know, it's tricky to distill that one. It's, it, I can I can honestly say it's annoyingly tricky to distill it. And as many times as I've done it, sometimes I'm just still not quite satisfied and still don't think I've gotten it quite right. So I just keep keep trying. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how nuanced these are. And uh, I think we first, I don't know about you, I think I first had that vintage, uh, that pre-band, I think it was when we were in Paris, actually, with uh, Peter Schaff. Uh, I think that was the first time I had it. And I was like, let me, I think uh, we were ever, ever at his apartment. Uh, and I was like, Ted, you got to make this one. Uh, so I'm glad you did. That was a, uh, that was a- uh, 2001. Yeah, that was a long time ago. Uh, uh, but. <laughs> So Ted, Absinthe has a uh, has a really storied history. Um, what do you think the future has in stock? Uh, you mentioned the the rise in absinthe related cocktails. I think that's at least part of the answer. Um, but where do you think absinthe's going to go in the next ten years, twenty years? What do you think the future of absinthe looks like? Well, I think absinthe is well established in the market that by today, and it's it's basically it's a legit. A product that's viewed with a great deal of um, historical intrigue. Um, it's an indelible product uh, in, in the in the craft cocktail experience. You have to have it, or there is a whole palette of cocktails that you can't make. You can't substitute pastis or any sugared industrial product. Uh, none of them is a substitute for a proper absinthe. So what I'm seeing is not necessarily that that people who drink absinthe are drinking more of it. We're finding that more and more people are being introduced to it. And the advent of, of course, the web, um, and then social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, things like that have, have uh, made it, have made good quality absinthe more accessible. Mm -hmm. and that's really helped catalyze global interest in it. Uh, I, you know, I feel questions from all over the world about, hey, how do I buy your products? And sometimes in, un, in the most unlikely of places. So it's good that, you know, people are definitely interested. They're interested in getting good products because, you know, there's still some, there's still some offenders out there. No, that's true. But, yeah, you know that, you know, yeah, sugar and blue oh, yeah. dye and all that. Yeah. 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 yeah so there's, it's sad to know that somewhere, 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 someone's burning absinthe and that makes me sad. Um, Ted, where can people find you? Where can people find you? Where can people find your uh, your absence? I'll, uh, I'll of course have links in the description to uh, to, to to Ted's uh, to Ted's to Ted's uh, product line and things like that. But where can people find you? Let's see. Well, people can find um, what I do, Jade Liqueurs at jadeliqueurs.com or more easily vintageabsinthe.com takes you to the same place. Um, you can find us on the web. We're also Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know, social media platforms. Um, additionally, um, they can find us. We're now going to the second printing um, of a book. Uh, I have a copy of it in front of me called Absent the Exquisite Elixir. Absent the Exquisite Elixir. And this is um, on Amazon. Um, and through any place that where one chooses, one likes to buy books. Um, I'm pleased to say it's five-star reviews, very lavishly illustrated uh, with a great deal of historical context and insight as to what actually happened in the world of Madison. Uh, so you can understand it um, completely and accurately from the first time and not, to, not have to wade through a minefield like you and I did for so many years. So fortunately, good information is out there, and it is being permeated. So yeah, that's basically how they can find me. Yes, it's a good days now. We can just actually go to a to a bodega and pick up a really good, authentic bottle of of absinthe made by people like Ted, as opposed to you know us skulking around in the cellars of France trying to find them twenty years ago. <laughs> right, or trying to trying to buy them from French collectors and yeah. Swiss collectors. Yeah, yeah uh, I think yeah, because we we hand brought a bottle back uh, that trip there to Paris. We uh, that and uh, you know trying to get an absinthe spoon back in the day was was a Herculean affair. Now you can get them by the dozens uh, online. So it's yeah, they've they've all seemed to have surfaced. 
uh, all of a sudden. So yeah, the, the world of absinthe antiques, which was quite a special world, um, so many years. Yeah, that was, uh, was quite a lot of fun. There was a, once upon a time, there was, I, I should say, a golden era for those of us that were on the uh, early on the curve, but we, we did a lot of ice breaking. And in my, and in my case, I did a lot of, I was subjected to a lot of skull crushing with various uh, government bureaucracies and laws and fines. But um, yeah, but all those barriers have for the most part been broken. And so now every, you know, everyone else can just walk through and, and access good information and usually find good quality products. Um, both here, I know that, you know, my, my jade absence are distributed widely in the United States, UK, Europe, quite easy to get them, uh, which took years to do. Right. Um, but, you know, it's uh, consumers today. Yeah, those who are interested in absence today definitely, definitely have it easier than we did, you know, 20 and then, of course, 25 years ago, you know, when I was interested in this and finding many, many obstacles and hoops of fire just to answer simple questions with every answer, no doubt, resulting in two more questions. So, yeah, tough times. Yeah, folks, if you want to check out Ted's absence, make sure to check out the links in the description below. I'll have links to where to find him and find his absence. And Ted, I just want to, one, thank you for all the work you've done getting absence back into uh, the now and into a world of respectability, into people's cocktails and into people's uh, absinthe glasses that you can now buy on amazon.com. Um, and also just want to thank you for coming on Esoterica and discussing uh, what, I, what I would argue, and I think you might agree with me, what has to be the most esoteric of all historical spirits. <laughs> this definitely was not part of my original career path. <laughs> Let's just say that. Uh, my career was hijacked by absence, so, uh, you know, but anyway, it seemed like it was just meant to be, but um, anyway, I'm proud to, you know, I'm, I'm proud to, to contribute this strange little piece of, of human culture and history to your um, dossier of fine, informative videos, and I'm pleased to be a subscriber, so very much enjoyed your work. Yeah, thank you, Ted. Thank you. All right, Ted. Well, uh, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, next time I pour a glass of uh, absinthe, which I'll be doing here in the next couple of days, I'm, I'm turning 40 and so I'm opening a bottle of vintage absinthe. I will, uh, I'll say Sante to you. <laughs> and you Sante friend. to you, my friend. <laughs> you, Ted. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed our chat. I've included the links in the description below if you want to find Ted and his wonderful absinthe. I really, really do recommend them highly. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and you've been watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.